Hi, I'm Dr. Younger, and this is my weekly update from the laboratory. If I had a colleague who had built a time machine, and that colleague said, you can be the one to use it, but it's only going to work once. You have to go now, and it's going to send you 100 years into the future, and you can stay there for an hour, and then you come back, and that's it. What would I do? I would uh, get a notebook. I would write down as many diseases as I could. And when I got there, I would spend that hour trying to get to the medical library or getting to a hospital and asking as many doctors as I can, how do you treat multiple sclerosis? How do you treat cancer? How do you cure fibromyalgia? How do you cure myalgic encephalomyelitis? I would go through as many diseases as I could, furiously writing down the treatments or the cures. And if I had a few seconds left at the end, I'd grab a sports almanac. But then I would come back and I would have the answers to all of these diseases that we currently don't have effective treatments for. And that's really the dream of the biomedical scientist is to have the answers. Now, I don't have a colleague like that. So I have to try to predict what is going to be the treatments of the future. And that really is probably the number one decision that I have to make in my laboratory, what treatments to go after. I have to choose extremely carefully because when I am pursuing a treatment for a disease, it takes years to do the proper testing, to get the funding, to get the regulatory approvals, to do the tests, the analyses, then the secondary and tertiary studies. It takes years. Uh, and millions of dollars in a lot of cases. And so if I get it wrong and the treatment doesn't work, I have now spent a enormous part of my academic career and I want to avoid that. So again, I have to pick very carefully. There are thousands, easy thousands of compounds that have a theoretical benefit for pain and fatigue and cognitive disorders that are due to brain inflammation. But at the very top of that list for me is dextronaltrexone. Now this is not dextromethorphan, it's not dextroamphetamine, it's dextronaltrexone. You have probably never heard of this and it's almost impossible to find any information about it. And that's because it's never been used in people before. But I think for a variety of reasons, I think it may be one of the most important pharmaceuticals for pain and fatigue and cognitive disorders due to brain inflammation. So let me tell you about it. Now, you probably have heard of naltrexone, just regular naltrexone, or low-dose naltrexone, which is just naltrexone at lower dosages. You might have heard of low-dose naltrexone because it's used for chronic pain like fibromyalgia pain, it's used for autoimmune disorders like Crohn's disease and multiple sclerosis, used in some fatigue. It's being used in long COVID. So you might've heard of lotus naltrexone. I've talked about it before. And lotus naltrexone works because the compound crosses the blood-brain barrier and it calms down microglia. And when you calm down microglia, you keep them from producing pro-inflammatory factors in your brain, which cause pain and fatigue and cognitive disorders. And so when you reduce those pro-inflammatory factors, you reduce those symptoms. And it has a pretty good response rate in a number of different conditions, like fibromyalgia, where we have about a 50% response rate. So a very useful tool, but there's a downside to naltrexone or lotus naltrexone. And that is, it actually works on two sites. I talked about one site, that's the microglia. That's a beneficial action. But naltrexone is also an opioid antagonist which means it blocks your opioid receptors. And that is not a good thing. You need your opioid system to reduce pain. Like that's where your beta endorphins work. And so if you wipe out your opioid system, you, you've taken away your body's pain regulatory systems. It's used in kind of reward and euphoria and positive mood. So if you block your opioid systems completely, which naltrexone can do at around 50 milligrams or even lower, when you do that, you basically create dysphoria and malaise. And I know that because I've tested that uh, quite a while ago. 
And we don't want to do that because if you're creating any malaise or dysphoria, that's going to offset the benefits you get from reducing the brain inflammation. So as a result, we have to work in this really restrictive window of dosage around 0.5 milligrams to maybe six milligrams at the top end per day. So that's a, that's a short window. If we go any lower than 0.5, then there's not enough of the substance making it into your brain to target the microglia and it won't be effective. And then if we get above six, we're starting to get closer to complete blockade of your opioid system, which would create the malaise and the dysphoria. And so we're really caught. And the fact is, is that some people likely need a higher dosage than six to have an effective microglia response. The lower dosages won't work, but we can't go higher because of the opioid antagonistic effect. And so that means that low dose naltrexone may not work for people because of that higher limit. So what if we could remove that higher limit, get rid of it? And we may be able to do that. And this is based on work primarily by Linda Watkins and Mark Hutchinson, where they explored dextronaltrexone. So when you take naltrexone, you're not actually taking just naltrexone. You're actually taking levonaltrexone, or the left form of naltrexone. And as I've just mentioned, there's another form of naltrexone, which is called dextro, or the right form of naltrexone. And these two forms of naltrexone are stereoisomers. They're mirror images of each other. They have the same chemical formula, but they're arranged opposite to each other. It's just like your hands, which is why I'm using my hands. Your hands are pretty much the same thing. They both have five fingers. They both have five fingernails. They both have thumbs. So your hands are pretty similar, but they're not identical because if you try to overlay them, they don't overlay perfectly. For one thing, your thumbs are going different directions. And it's the same thing with chemical formulas. You may not think that that's a big deal with your hands, but with chemical formulas, it's a really big deal. And that's because that order of the atoms has a, a lot to do with how that compound is going to act on the receptors. So the effects are different, even though the chemical formula is the same. And so levo and dextro and naltrexone are going to do different things. Now, dextro is quite similar to levo. Uh, it has the same effect on microglia. It crosses the blood-brain barrier. It calms the microglia down. It reduces the production of those pro-inflammatory chemicals centrally that's causing the pain and fatigue and cognitive and mood disorders. But it has one critical difference, which you probably have already guessed what that difference is, and that is it doesn't antagonize the opioid system. So we don't have to worry about that malaise and dysphoria by wiping out your opioid system that you need. So that upper limit is gone. That means we have much more flexibility in the dosage that we give to people to antagonize the microglia system, which is what we want to do. Now that means that this drug may be more effective than low-dose naltrexone, which is levonaltrexone, and it may work in a considerably greater number of people who didn't respond to lotus naltrexone, but they will respond to dextronaltrexone because we can raise the dosage and accommodate different types of people. So that's the big idea. It's basically lotus naltrexone, but a more effective version of it. Now, what do we do next? Well, we have to test this in patients because right now everything I just told you in terms of how it works in people is theoretical. It's a hypothesis. It's built on a lot of scientific information, but it's still a hypothesis, and it could be completely wrong. So we have to test in patients. That is easier said than done. Uh, as I mentioned before, this substance has never been used in humans, in the history of humans, as far as we know. Now, maybe there was a scientist because the compound has existed. Uh, there might have been a scientist who waited for everyone to go home and then late at night tried some themselves to see what would happen. Chemistry has a long history of scientists doing that, but I don't know. As far as I know, no human has ever taken dextronaltrexone. And there's a lot of steps to get it to the point where we can use it in humans. 
and they're all revolving around safety. So FDA is one example. I talked about FDA in my uh, video from last week. So I'm working on it. Uh, to, to make it happen, it will probably take, I'm guessing, about $2 million to do it. About five years ago, we priced it out. And at that time, about five years ago, it was about $1.5 million to do to get it synthesized, get it through safety testing, and use it in a small group of patients. Um, but again, since it was five years ago, there's been a lot of inflation. So the chemical reagents are probably more expensive and everything's more expensive. So I'm going to guess it's around $2 million right now. And then what would happen is I have colleagues at different places in the United States that will do different parts of the process. So we have a colleague in the Research Triangle Institute who can synthesize the dextrin naltrexone, including um, a special form or, or a special technique or, or a series of procedures so it can be used in humans. So you have to be very, very careful when you're making things for human consumption. Then that will be shipped to a colleague in Mississippi who can do the preclinical safety testing. And then it goes to me to do the human testing. So the main thing in that process now is to locate the funds to do this testing and to get it to the point where we can try it in patients. There's a variety of ways to do that. Uh, this is not a, a video to try to recruit funding. I just want to update you on what my priorities are. Uh, in terms of where we're going to get the funding, we have not determined that yet. I do think that this drug will be too experimental for a lot of federal sources. I don't think they would fund it. I think they're going to want a lot more preliminary data before they get involved. It's possible they would, but I don't know for sure. I think we're probably going to locate a different funding source to do this. But anyway, I'm going to be focusing on this in the second half of this year, 2024. In the first half, I'm working on some more um, standard typical grants. Then starting in July, August, I'll start working on dextrone naltrexone funding uh, quite a bit. And so I'll give you updates then. So if I can get the funding and if I can get the chemical, we will be able to start testing. And then we'll find out pretty quickly at that point if it's actually going to work. So I'll keep you updated along the process so you don't have to wait till the scientific publication goes out. I'll actually let you know at every step how it's going. All you have to do is uh, watch. Uh, the videos I'm putting out every Monday weekly, and I will keep you completely up to date. So just in the meantime, keep this one compound, this dextrone naltrexone, kind of keep that in the back of your head, just kind of store it there so you'll recognize it if you hear it again. And that's basically it. I just, again, want to keep you updated on really what's my top priorities right now and going forward. And dextrone naltrexone has been on my list for a long time, and it's finally time for me to move on it and actually kind of do the steps where we can actually get it tested. So I thank you for listening. And if you have any uh, questions, you can put those in the comments and I'll spend a couple of hours and get it to as many questions as I can. So I look forward to uh, seeing your responses and I hope uh, to see you here next Monday. Thanks.